you know U.S. Route 40 that originates in Atlantic City, New Jersey? It's the old route before Interstate 70 was built. It crossed 12 states and dates back to 1926. Like the famous Route 66, it has been bypassed with a modern interstate. As with Route 66, 40 has many old attractions, diners, and motels that once were the welcome sight to weary travelers along its route. Most of the diners are closed, the motels are abandoned, and much of 40 doesn't even exist now. It would be more interesting than taking the interstate home from a political rally in Washington, where old 40 passed through. I thought it would be a way to relax and enjoy a bygone part of America. How wrong I was. I was driving from Washington, D.C. to Dayton, Ohio, a trip I have made many times. Via I-70, it's about seven and a half hours. Old Route 40 would take about 11 or 12 hours. The thought that it would get me out of the political mindset that the rally had put me in appealed to me. I'd find a motel when it got late and take the extra time to get home refreshed. I left Washington in the early afternoon. Being December, it got dark a little after five o'clock. Sleet was bouncing off the road by the time I reached Harrisburg. My windshield was icing up, making visibility difficult, so I relied on my cell phone with the old route mapped as closely as possible. At some point, the road disappeared and my cell phone gave me alternate directions. This didn't worry me as I expected some necessary deviations. As I drove further in Pennsylvania, the roads became slippery with ice and snow buildup. I had been on a long stretch through nothing but forest. There are no service centers or food stops except abandoned SO gas stations. It was just past 11 when I checked my cell directions and it was no longer getting any bars. It had been several hours since it updated my position, it appeared. I would yet to learn where I was. I blindly followed a road and took turns when I had no other options. The thought that I was way off course gave me some anxiety and the deteriorating weather complicated my rattled brain already exhausted from staring through an icy windshield. I needed my cell phone map to know where I was going and where I was. I could be driving in circles for all I knew, but I figured I'd eventually get to some town and find a motel if I just kept plowing on. An hour or so later, I was still in the forest, and the sleet had turned into blowing snow. Ahead of me, I saw an intersection coming up. An old Kenworth parked alongside the road with its hazard lights on. I figured he was having the same difficulty as I was this wintry night. I took that turn as a sign indicated food, gas, and a motel in half a mile. My cell phone still showed no bars when I spotted the glow of a motel sign. It was missing a letter and spelled MTEL, but no other lights were visible. The parking lot was empty and unplowed, but I pulled in to check. I was so tired. Driving in bad weather and getting lost is exhausting. I was sitting in front of the sign saying office, wondering if they had a room I could crash in when the Kenworth pulled into the motel. I heard its air break and the final puff of exhaust as it settled to a stop perpendicular to my car in the motel parking lot. I didn't give it another thought as I fussed with my cell phone, trying to get reception, but that was futile. It was a dead zone. I was about to turn my engine off to go into the motel lobby, which was dark, and for whatever reason, that didn't bother me. Now, in retrospect, I was just so tired and lost, I was willing to knock on a lightless motel office door. I know it doesn't make sense now, but on that night, it seemed the thing to do. Before I could, my car started to rock as the driver from the Kenworth walked over to my car and yanked on the door handle so hard the whole car shook. He was as big as a mountain with long hair falling from a trucker's cap. His teeth as big as yellow nails gnashed from under his tobacco-stained beard. He was incoherent as he rampaged at my door. I looked into his eyes and felt a fear I had never experienced. He looked at me as if he was going to eat me alive. In sheer panic, I threw the car in reverse coming within inches of his truck grill with its blazing fog lights drilling into my eyes. I returned to the old highway, spitting my tires in the snow. In 12 minutes, I made it to Somerset. How I got here, I don't know. I found a motel and got a room. 
when I told the clerk about the motel I had stopped at earlier, she said the old place had been abandoned for three months. The owners had died and there was no one to take it over. It wasn't worth saving as it was off the main route. Why the sign was still lighted, she had no idea. As for the trucker who attacked me, I don't know what he intended to do with me, but I'm sure if he could have gotten his hands on me, he would have killed me. It was completely insane. I was lucky to have escaped with my life from that abandoned motel. Time, often elusive in the tranquility of the forest, turned against me and my girlfriend on one fateful October hike. We were lucky to escape this forest of horrors after a grueling encounter. Tammy and I packed a tent and some cooking gear, went backpacking to Tennessee for a weekend. We are experienced backpackers and in good physical condition. This hike turned escape run for your life trail took every ounce of our energy and skill to survive. Our plan was to backpack the Michamaqua Trail, a highly challenging route of 20 miles over rough terrain. You can hike it in 10 or 11 hours if you have the strength. We carried backpacks with a tent, a sleeping bag, food we did not have to cook. The forest was dry in October, and we were cautious about fire. We would camp about halfway and enjoy the Tennessee mountain backcountry solitude. We arrived at the trailhead on Friday night and found a campground nearby. We grilled hot dogs and made a can of Bush's baked beans and the provided fire ring. It was cold and the wind was damp with a light drizzle, so we settled into our sleeping bags and told each other scary stories. They didn't really scare us, but they did promote snuggling close. The rain had stopped in the morning, but it was foggy and damp. We fried some eggs and bacon, made some coffee and warmed our hands on the fire. We packed our gear in our backpacks, leaving the heavy iron skillet and cooking equipment in the car. It was a different start than we had initially planned. It seemed wiser to let the trail dry before attempting it. A wet, muddy trail makes a problematic path even harder, so we moved slowly and enjoyed our morning drinking coffee. At 10.30, we laced up our boots and hit the trail. The Michamaqua is challenging in its terrain, but it's beautiful, especially in the fall. Every tree is vibrant in color. The best part of fall backpacking is the tranquility and the absence of other hikers, which give you a sense of calmness. The trail was sloppy with mud, and the way was arduous, but we still reveled in the beauty. After sunset, we made camp a short way off the trail in a dense thicket. We ate sandwiches, drank cold coffee from our thermos, and crawled into our tent. We were only in a short time when we heard men in a heated argument. We pulled our muddy boots back on, put on a jacket, and snuck out of the tent to see what the commotion was about in the Tennessee mountains, miles from the nearest town. We crawled through the thicket to the ravine's edge and peered into the darkness. At that moment, the branch that Tammy was using to support us gave way with a snap. And in the slippery mud, we slid down into the ravine landing on our bellies smack in front of the two men. I could see a copper whiskey still with a propane burner's blue flame under it as I looked around. The area was littered with barrels and empty sacks. We had accidentally slid into a moonshine operation. The first man ran for a rifle. The second picked up an axe from a wood pile behind him. I yelled to Tammy, run. Together we pushed through the thicket only to reach a cliff at least 40 feet down, but with the men only a minute behind us, we had no choice but to climb down in the dark. I'm thankful we had done rock climbing on previous backpacking trips. We hit the ground about the same time as the men appeared over the top of the ledge. Two shots rang out. I didn't see where they hit. Tammy and I dashed into the dark undergrowth and ran, tripping over roots and rocks. We ran in only a partial moon for light. After 30 minutes, we figured we had evaded the moonshiners, but we were hopelessly lost in the night. We bivouacked in a cave, too dark and dangerous in this area with steep cliffs to continue at night, staying warm with our body heat together. In the early morning light, we hiked following a stream until we found a dirt road that led us to the highway. From there, we walked back to our car. It was a chilling nightmare. We were lucky to have escaped alive.
When I was 20, I embarked on a five-day solo kayak camping adventure on the All Sable River in Michigan. It was a dream I had from childhood. My dad would take me on the Al Sable to fly fish with him. He always told me stories about how he had canoed the Al Sable by himself when he was just out of high school and how that had been the most incredible experience. It bonded him to the river for his lifetime. I wanted that for myself, and at the same time, I wanted my dad to be proud of me for following in his footsteps or paddle strokes. I put in at Grayling and would cover 120 miles to Lake Huron. There are six dams to portage, and if I maintained a steady stroke, I would enter Lake Huron in five days. It would take six days if I stopped to fish the brown trout. I had a tackle box of streamers for fall fly fishing just in case I saw a lot of fish. I reached the Mio Pond campground on the first day, next to the Mio Pond Dam Portage. When I arrived, there was no one there. I set up my one-man tent with an inflatable mattress and bug screen. I found some sticks along the bank that I could snap over my knee to build a campfire. In no time, I had a small blaze. I carved a stick to roast a hot dog and put a camp coffee pot filled with a hand pump that said boil before drinking on the fire for hot coffee. Being October, the sun set earlier, and the nights got cold quickly. A hot cup of coffee sitting around the campfire was relaxing after a hard day of paddling. I was watching the fire, sitting on a log seat, holding a hot coffee, when a man appeared from outside in the glow of the fire. He walked over and sat on another log without saying a word. I was surprised as he made no greeting or anything. I said, hey there, in a friendly voice, and continued, I've got hot coffee if you'd like some. The guy didn't even look at me. Still trying to break the ice, I attempted conversation. You just camping or are you paddling as well? No response. The strange man just sat, staring at the fire. If my only hospitality was a warm fire, that is fine. Let him sit. After an hour, he stood up without a word and walked away. I was a little jittery after my bizarre guest. I took my mag light and swept the area when walking to the toilet. I walked to the lake's embankment and back to my tent. There was no other tent or kayak. The fire was coals by this time, so I didn't bother adding more wood and zipped myself into my sleeping bag and tent. I lay there, straining my ears for any footsteps. This really creeped me out because, as I started to listen to the night forest, there were dozens of noises in the dark. The rustling of the dry leaves in the wind, a raccoon scratching at an old log, a deer eating in the underbrush, crickets chirping. The forest at night is a noisy place. I finally fell asleep, but was awoken by a hard kick to my side. I don't know when it was, but it was very dark, except for my now ablaze campfire. Five men stood around it. None of them were speaking. The guy who kicked me had unzipped my tent and was dragging my sleeping bag out with me in it. I recognized him as the man who had sat at my campfire. Two others came over, took my cell phone, and threw it into the fire. They ransacked my tent and gear. They were all big men, much bigger than me. I didn't resist wishing for a resolution that never came. One of the men put a gun to my head, looking me dead in the eye. I closed my eyes, and bang, a flash of light and stars shot through my head in darkness. I woke up a couple of hours later, darkness all around me. My head hurt terribly, and when I touched my scalp, it was caked with blood. I looked around, and I wasn't at the campground. I was dizzy and disoriented, lost at night along the Au Sable River. The men had apparently hit me with the butt of the gun and dragged me somewhere in the forest, left to die. I lay there too frightened to move. At first light, I crawled along the river's edge until I saw a bridge. My father picked me up at a breakfast restaurant several hours later. What the men at the campground were about, I have no idea but I think their intent was to kill me for intruding. This is my most chilling nightmare. Subscribe.